depending on who you ask, socialists are guilty of many sins. We're accused of, of only focusing on the economy, of reducing everything to class, of believing in bloodthirsty revolution, and simultaneously being enveloped in utopian fantasies. All of these would be pretty bad if any of them were true. Uh, and each of them deserves a serious response from the socialist left. But for tonight, I want to focus on a different one of the major sins, uh, sinful ac accusations levied at socialists, namely that socialists are technological determinists. And that's kind of a jargony mouthful, I know. Uh, basically, it just means that socialists are accused of seeing all of human history as a predetermined, predestined series of events that come about because we have more and more technology. Greater technology means greater historical development. This is sinful because it's seen as cold and heartless, saying people have no real free will or individual agency. We're all just cogs in a machine. Now, I'm a socialist, and I think that sounds pretty bad. I also think it's wrong. And so I want to try to explain what a real socialist theory of history is and why it matters. So first, according to the critics, where does this notion of technological determinism come from? Well, as I said a moment ago, it comes from good old Karl Marx. He is typically the source of these accusations. So what did Marx actually say? Well, he both said a lot of things and not enough things. Marx is credited as the originator of the socialist theory of history, but he also never really wrote out his theory at length. We have a few scattered references across Marx's early writing, but many of these quotes seem incompatible. So for instance, in The Poverty of Philosophy, he says that the hand mill gives you society with, uh, with the feudal lord, the steam mill gives you society with the industrial capitalist. Okay, that's fairly technologically deterministic. But then in the Communist Manifesto, he writes, the history of all previously existing society is the history of class struggle. Okay, so which is it? Does the steam mill give us capitalism or does class struggle? The steam mill is not sentient. It does not have individual agency. People do. So it seems more accurate to agree with the second statement. But is all history really class struggle? Well, as Terry Eagleton writes, we can't, of course, he can't, of course, mean that literally. If brushing my teeth last Wednesday counts as part of history, then it is hard to see that this is a matter of class struggle. Perhaps history refers to public events, not private ones like brushing one's teeth. But that brawl in the bar last night was public enough. So perhaps history is confined to major public events. But by whose definition? It might count as an instance of class struggle if Che Guevara had been run over by a truck, but only if a CIA agent was at the wheel. Otherwise, it would have just been an accident. The story of women's oppression interlocks with the history of class struggle, but it is not just an aspect of it. This, uh, the same goes for the poetry of Wordsworth and Seamus Henney. Class struggle can't cover everything. So what does class, co what does class struggle cover? Well, to have class struggle, you have to have classes. And to know what class struggle is, you have to know what a class is. So what makes up a class? Well, obviously a class is really just a big group of people, but what kind of people? Are people who drive trucks a class or people who eat at McDonald's, people who buy Gucci? If someone is really courteous or wears a nice suit, are they classy? Uh, I mean, I think all of these sorts of things actually obscure what class is. And the reason is, is that class can't truly be defined on its own. A class only exists in relation to another class. So to call someone a worker or a member of the working class means that they work for someone else in a different class. So class is defined by a relation, a relationship to another class on the basis of property, who owns what. And in the words of the late great Eric Olin Wright, class expresses that what you have determines what you have to do to make a living in our society. So if you own a factory or a business that generates profit and you hire workers in your own workplace, you are a capitalist. And if you don't own that stuff and you have to find a job to get the money you need to get by, you're a worker. It can be broken down further than that, of course, but that's, that's the gist. So these sorts of relationships, capitalist and worker, worker and landlord, worker and worker, capitalist and capitalist, these sorts of relationships are what Marx calls the relations of production. Think of relationships. When I say relations, that's what I'm referring to. This is what class struggle is focused on. These are distinguished from something else Marx calls the forces of production. And I'm going to explain that in a second. Now, if you ask most people how history proceeds, they'd say that history has progressed. It might mean that in terms of social progress, 
like the fact that most people today have more humane and kind feelings toward others than they did say when we had slavery or when women couldn't vote or own property or when gay people weren't allowed to marry. But they might also mean progress in terms of productivity. It seems that society just keeps on getting more advanced year after year. But what is advancing? Well, Marx would say that the forces of production are advancing or improving. And the forces are just those things that are used by producers to produce products in the production process. Say that three times fast. It's just the things that make production and productivity possible. More concretely, the forces of production include our ability to labor or expend effort, uh, what Marx calls the, our labor power, and the means of production. And the means of production include tools, machines, land and space, and raw materials. So whenever I say forces, just think of like the ability to labor and technology. Marx says these things advance because over time they're, repl they're replaced by superior forces or are used more productively. Okay, so hopefully you're all still with me. Relations of production, forces of production. How the fuck does this explain history? <laughs> well, Marx wrote out his most articulate uh, explanation in the preface to the contribution to the critique of political economy of 1859. And instead of reading out what he wrote, I think it'd be better to show you G.A. Cohen doing what I think is a fairly accurate reenactment of the moment that Marx wrote this document. He was just about to sit down at his desk and write when, Carl, this is Jenny calling. I'm ready. I'm waiting. It's your wife. I'll be there in a few minutes. In the social production of their life. Man, where's my man? I want you, Carl. I'm waiting. I'll be there soon, Jenny. Men enter into... Carl, I want you. I'm ready. You said you'd have, re you'd have relations with... Yes, relations. Men enter into relations that are... Carl, you need it. You know you can't do without... Yes that are indispensable and Carl it's not a matter of choice for you one look at me and you'll fall into my arms and independent of their will <clears throat> Carl hurry Jenny I'll be with you in a moment I'm inspired I've got it on the tip of my how to say you know what <laughs> the sum total of these relations from the economic structure of society the real, uh, the real, uh, Carl, the mattress is terrific today. It's really strong. The real foundation upon which, Carl, are you getting bigger? Are you getting bigger for me, Carl? Upon which rises, yes. <laughs> a, uh, Carl, there's nothing wrong with it, you know. It's not against the law. You should come now. Upon which rises. It's not against the law, Carl. A legal and political mm, upon which rises a legal. Carl, will you bring your superstructure up to me right now, please? I'm dying for it. A superstructure <laughs> and to which correspond. Carl, I can't help it anymore. I'm full of these fantasies in my brain. There's so much I can't stop thinking about. Please, Carl, these ideas, they're wonderful. Definite forms of social consciousness. Uh, Carl, her, I'm coming, I'm coming. Is that all right? R.I.P. to a legend. Uh, so to reiterate what's just been said, Marx argued that the forces of production, meaning our ability to labor and the means of production, tools, machinery, land, and their specific level of productivity determine which relations of production, worker to capitalist, peasant to lord, exist in a given moment in history. But then these relations place limits on the forces to develop. And the result is that the relations will come into conflict with the forces and create new relations that best meet the requirements of the forces to continue to advance. So hunter-gatherer society, societies with just a little bit of productivity were replaced by feudal lords and peasants with just a little bit more productivity. And then feudal lords and peasants were replaced by capitalists and workers because of the way production was carried out to increase productivity needed or carried out 
to increase productivity needed a new set of social property relations. This actually isn't all that different than many conservative arguments. Conservatives say history is kind of a continuous blossoming of ever greater productive power and living standards, all leading up to the present moment. The big difference is that they say that modern day capitalism was something that naturally evolved and grew up, and grew up from the younger, less robust version of itself in the past through moments of eureka. Uh, they also are saying all this to try to justify uh, capitalism on moral grounds and as an inevitable part of human nature, but that's besides the point. Marx and socialists broadly say that history has distinct historical epochs. Feudalism and capitalism are different periods of human history because they're defined by different social rules for everyone involved. So in feudalism, a peasant has partial ownership of the land that he works and has to offer the Lord a cut of what he produces. A worker doesn't own the land or other productive assets and has to sell her ability to work to a boss in exchange for a wage. So the classic theory of history, according to Marx, explains how humans have moved from one epoch to another, and the theory has roughly four major epochs that translate to something like this. Uh, and so I'm using a little bit of different terminology, but a pre-class society is what I'm calling like hunter-gatherer, where they have really no surplus. And the surplus is basically just those resources that are left over after uh, enough has been expended to make sure everyone you know, in society doesn't die. Although, you know, that everyone is a, a shifting category, let's say, but more or less, they don't have much left over. It's, it's basically subsistence. Um, but in pre-capitalist class society, which we're, I'm thinking of feudalism, there's some surplus. And this is mostly consumed by uh, the lords and by kings, and it mostly goes to paying for castles and armies and that sort of thing. But in capitalist society, we have a much higher surplus. Uh, and in this society, obviously, capitalists, for the most part, because they hoard uh, all of the means of production, end up uh, having the first say at what to do with the surplus. And most of it is also hoarded or uh, put back into, um, it's reinvested so that they can end up just making more profit. But in a post-class society, a post-capitalist society, there's going to be a massive surplus where everybody's needs are met. And uh, it's it, this is what we're thinking of when we say socialism or communism, or this is what Marx is saying, effectively. Everyone's needs are met, and there's more than enough to go around. So class struggle gets you from one epoch to the next. But Marx also says that this order I just described is hardwired in. So we necessarily are going from hunter-gatherer to feudalism, and from feudalism to capitalism, and from capitalism to socialism and communism. We know the first two steps. That actually happened, and we have historical scholarship on them. How do we know that the next step is the socialism and or communism? So I've already explained two thirds of the puzzle. First, according to Marx, society tends to develop over time because the forces tend to advance. And second, the forces will compel the relations to change to new forces that allow for greater productivity. The third, the third reason, uh, the new forces that come to, to be only do so because they're optimal. Or in the words of G.A. Cohen, who we just saw a moment ago, when relations endure stably, they do so because they promote the development of the forces. When re uh, relations are revolutionized, the old relations cease to exist because they no longer favor the forces and the new relations come into being because they are apt to do so. Dysfunctional relations persist for a time before being replaced during that time, the character of the relations is explained by their uh, suitability to a past stage in the development of the forces. Thus, if the relations suit the development of the forces, they obtain because they suit the development of the forces. And if the relations do not suit the development of the forces, they obtain because they recently did so. So the relation of worker to capitalist exists because it enabled greater productivity than the relation of peasant to lord. That's the theory of history according to Marx. The ever advancing forces shape the relations which in turn fetter the forces and the forces really select new, more optimal relations to encourage the forces to advance ever more. Really simple, right? Okay, obviously this is fairly complex and you know, so is life, but the problem is the formulation is also wrong. This is typically the argument that gets called technologically deterministic. And while I could quibble about the accuracy of calling it that, I'd rather present what has been understood as a more plausible socialist theory of history. So a couple things. The first is that 
There is no reason to believe that capitalism necessarily leads to socialism, and certainly not because socialism is optimal for advancing productivity. The future is not determined, and when we look at previous transitions, say from feudalism to capitalism, it kind of happened on accident. Feudal lords pursuing their immediate class interests in the aftermath of a crisis accidentally changed the rules of the game. Oops. But nothing said they had to create capitalism. The other thing is that productivity increases occurring everywhere all the time is kind of exclusive to capitalism. So if you look at the history of economic growth, most of human history was actually fairly stagnant. Now, obviously, this isn't a graph of all of human history, um, but you kind of get the, the gist of, the, of what I'm talking about from this. This is the GDP per capita in England, which, as, as you all should know, England is where capitalism starts. But for most of, most of this time, it's basically just flatlining. And then beginning in uh, the 17th century, you're seeing you know, some little starting to trickle a little bit, starting to move a little bit, wiggle. Um, it's wiggling some more. It's going up and up. And then uh, by the 19th century, you're really starting to see that curve. And the 20th century, it's just it's it's uh, it's just a whole. You're in sp you're in space. You're on the moon now. So we have in fact had long periods of time with little to no productive growth. Finally, it's not quite the case that the productive forces, which again forces are the level of uh, technological and labor productivity, compel new productive relations into existence. As Vivek Chimmer, uh, Chipper summarizes the change in this theory, he writes, while the productive forces barely retain their capacity towards an upward ascent, the realization of this capacity is now contingent upon its interaction with other mechanisms in society, and the net outcome need not necessarily be in favor of growth. What the productive forces are doing now is not selecting for a particular set of production relations, but rather selecting against those which would induce a regression in the level of productive forces. The selectional role of the productive forces switched from selecting for a particu particular set of production relations to selecting against a class of production relations. So in other words, the fact that you have labor and technological productivity increases doesn't mean that the new forces will, uh, or that the new relations will just arise. People pursue their material interests within social structures that have both incentives and punishments built in, and the social relations that gov govern our lives can remain in place even if technology and the forces of production keep getting more productive and advanced. The only thing that the forces select against are less productive relations of production, and that's because of the power of the class structure and the rules for classes to reproduce themselves over time. There are people within uh, at a given epoch, an economic epoch, that are going to try to maintain that system because it's in their class interest to uh, to further their uh, material interest interest within that system. So in capitalism, capitalists increase productivity constantly, seemingly exponentially, as that graph I put up shows. And that's because in the war for profits, the way capitalists compete is by out-innovating their competitors. But this same process also destroys the physical and mental lives of the vast majority of us. For capitalists, we truly are just cogs in the machine. They really will grind us into dust if it means they can get more profit. So does all of this mean, after everything that I've just said, does all this mean that a real theory of history is just class struggle, as Marx said in the manifesto? <laughs> God, I, I, I wish it were that simple. Um, okay, not quite, but yeah, mostly. Mostly that's right. Um, but the actual process of capitalists acquiring more profit means that there are limitations placed on that class struggle. And the more mature Marx also knew this. Uh, as he wrote in Capital Volume 1, uh, the rise of wages is confined within limits that not only leave intact the foundations of the capitalist system, but also secure its reproduction on an increasing scale. The structure of capital accumulation both increases the productivity of the forces of production and places limitations on workers' capacity to fight back. Not their ability, but their capacity to actualize their ability. And that's because workers are dependent on their boss for their survival. Because they don't own the means of production, workers are forced to work for a boss in exchange for a wage. This basic power asymmetry is precisely why workers ultimately need institutions, unions, and political parties that multiply their class power. It is through their enhancement of capacity and power that they can then, in fact, 
fight back, and ultimately make history of their own choosing. Socialism may not be inevitable, but it's most certainly possible and winnable. Paul, <laughs> uh, are you a technological I, I, determinist or, or what? Well, first, let me say, I, I didn't know that video was coming, and that, <laughs> that was great. That really uh, that really threw me off. But um, Cohen's one of the best. He's... <laughs> He's uh, he is basically he reproduces Marx's like somewhat more deterministic argument of historical materialism of his theory of history mm -hmm. um, and does it in such a way that is just like unbelievably brilliant um, in that like we actually like actually have a theory of history for Marx based on his work, despite the fact that Marx had so, you know, kind of fragmented things to say about it. Right. Um, and it just I think. Cohen had like totally revolutionized like how we actually like should analyze uh, the world and talk um, in in Marxist terms. So and, you know, and now I to... know I know now the reason it was so fragmented was Jenny Marx. Apparently, yeah. he just couldn't couldn't focus. Um, but but no, I think you know I think a good example of kind of what you're talking about is um, automation and um, the length of the workday. You know, like we really technology is at a point where it could liberate us from a lot of work. Like we could be shortening the work day and spreading the work around like very easily, but you know, it's not going to be inevitable. That is a political mm -hmm. fight that has to be waged, you know, by workers. Um, and it has been over time. I mean, there's a reason, you know, before unions, it was very normal to just be working 60, 70 hours a week. The 40 hour work day didn't just like fall from the sky. They had to fight for that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we all know so much potential exists with technology and especially now the exponential rate that it's uh, improving, but none of that is inevitable. You know, that's a political fight. So I think that's a kind of a good way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly right, I think. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, that is the importance of class struggle. Like that is like workers fighting for their interests against the opposing interests of, of bosses broadly. Um, so, right. and this is part of the problem of like socialists historically. I mean, the other thing is like this project that we're a part of has only existed for like 150 years. So like there's been plenty of errors, there's been plenty of trial and error. A lot of socialists have just kind of take it, taken it as an inevitability that, um, you know, as capitalism proceeds and gets bigger and badder, um, more productive capitalists having more control over more resources, uh, that this necessarily will mean uh, the system will uh, fall apart and socialism, socialism might not be, um, uh, they still believe that you had to, you know, these are the people who believe this were in socialist parties. They had massive labor movements. Like they still believe like there was a good deal of importance for like them actually pursuing these politics. Um, but that it wasn't uh, if it was just when, when are we, when do we uh, bring about the revolution? And um, because the system cannot uh, maintain uh this this arrangement for much longer right and you know I, I can maybe understand that if i lived in 1917 but anyone living now who thinks that's inevitable um i don't know what world you're living in mm -hmm.